Good evening, and thank you for joining me in this lecture, organized in collaboration with the Spanish Embassy in London. My name is Felix Torzo, and I am Curatorial Assistant for Decorative Arts at the Wallace Collection. Today's talk is based on research I did for my MA's dissertation at the Universidad Autónoma in Madrid. We will explore the interior decoration of Philip V's Royal Algazar and the changes it underwent during the first decades of the 18th century. The Royal Alcazar was the official residence of the Spanish monarchy since Philip II established Madrid as the kingdom's capital in 1561. The building remained in such use until 1734, when a devastating fire turned it into ruins during the reign of Philip V, the first Spanish monarch of the Bourbon dynasty, here in the picture. Philip was Duc d'Anjou, the second son of Louis, Grand Dauphin of France, and grandson of Louis XIV. His life dramatically changed in 1700, when aged only 16, he was nominated heir to the Spanish throne. Charles II of Spain, a cousin of Louis XIV, died in Madrid with no natural heir, and two possible candidates to succeed him were proposed. Louis of Bourbon, Duc d'Anjou, and Charles of Habsburg, Archduke of Austria. The Spanish nobility opted for the Bourbon Duke, discarding the Habsburg dynasty that was believed to be responsible for the catastrophic situation of Spain's finances. The affront resulted in the war of succession to the Spanish throne between the French Bourbons and the Austrian Habsburgs. This conflict lasted 13 years, during which steep military expenditure stopped numerous building projects. When Philip V arrived in Madrid in February 1700, the city, his new palace, and even the attire of his servants displeased him. The next year, he married Maria Luisa of Savoy. To assure a French influence over the young royal couple, Louis XIV carefully handpicked Maria Luisa's courtiers, ahead of which was Marianne de la Tremoille, Princesse de Sursin, as her first lady-in-waiting or camarera mayor here in the picture. The arrival of the new king revolutionized the Spanish court at every level, although in a slow and deliberate fashion. During the first years of his reign, Philip V's policies were perceived as the cause for the regeneration that the country experienced. Following the advice of Louis XIV, life at court during the first years of the new reign was marked by a relaxation of the austere Habsburg etiquette. While the previous dynasty preferred the distancing of the king from his court, French etiquette placed the king at the centre of the court, always visible and accessible. However, solitude and retirement suited the introvert character of Philip V, and a compromise between both traditions was sought in the spaces of public display. But when it came to the royal private quarters, thanks to the forceful influence of the Princesse de Sursin, a French taste was increasingly implemented. The Algazar was radically different to the palaces where Philip V grew up, such as Versailles or Meudon, where the French Grand Gou established a stylistic unity in architecture and decoration. Whereas almost every surface in French palaces were filled with references to royal power and dignity, the Algazar restricted such messages to paintings and tapestries hanging on the walls and in few fresco decorations. Only limited spaces, such as the octagonal room or pieza chavada and the hall of mirrors, combined painted decoration with fittings and furnishings as part of a unified ensemble. Most of the rooms in the Algazar were simple orthogonal spaces with whitewashed walls a date of tiles decorated with blue flowers and terracotta floors. Tall windows towards the square were finished with a veranda creating narrow balconies, while narrow small internal windows provided the courtyard rooms with light. Some coffered ceilings showed a complex decoration reminiscent of Islamic traditions, but most of the rooms were covered with simple flat ceilings, such as the one shown in Velázquez's Las Meninas. 
the king's and queen's apartments in the Habsburg Alcazar faced the south facade. They were large, well lit and richly furnished in the Baroque taste. Some pieces of furniture were decorated with hard stones in the Florentine and Roman traditions, others in carved and gilt wood, and others made of exotic dark woods such as ebony, sometimes encrusted with ivory, mother of pearl or polished metals. In addition, there were lacquered tables, mirrors and silver gilt furniture. Velvet and embroidered hangings and covers for beds and sitting furniture completed the ensemble. Such profusion of materials, techniques and styles would have caused a clashing effect that would have accentuated a sensation of lack of comfort. The absence of wood panelling in the interior decoration of Spanish palaces, with its warm and elegant effect, responded to the need of creating versatile spaces that could be warmed up in winter by adding thick tapestries to the walls and straw mats on the floor, and cooled down in summer by sprinkling the terracotta floors with water. In the image, we see Philip II's apartment at El Escorial, with an interior decoration probably not dissimilar to what Philip V and Maria Luisa of Savoy would have found in the Alcazar. In 1705, Teodoro Ardemans became first architect to the king and embarked on a plan to modernize the Alcazar. He recorded the state of the Alcazar before works started in his Ortografía del Real Alcázar de Madrid, here in the picture. Up until now, the organization of the palace was of a marked Hispanic character, with an emphasis towards the center of the building. Where the main spaces for royal representation were situated, such as the chapel, the two courts and the hall of comedies, as opposed to the private apartments facing the main facade of the building. This disposition would be shifted with the arrival of the new king. The first transformations concerned the suit of interior rooms towards the courtyard in the south wing of the Alcazar, those occupied by the former hall of comedies. This was the only proper public space in the building, and it communicated directly with their majesty's apartments. This was originally a multi-purpose room for theatre plays, public royal dinners, court weddings and royal funerals. If we compare Ardemans' 1705 map here to the left with a partial map he made circa 1709 here to the right, a 19th century copy, we see changes in the distribution of spaces. The long hall of comedies is divided into smaller spaces that will suit better the needs of the new royal family. The room of the cabinets, Pieza Nueva de los Gabinetes, has been transformed into their majesty's bedroom. To create this new room, the south wall leading to the hall of mirrors is closed off and the cabinets are dismantled. A new wall is added to the west creating a space known as Pieza del Cancel that acts as an access to the palace chapel. These changes are influenced by French palatial architecture, where rooms were ordered in line or enfilade that creates a long perspective through various rooms. To the west of the Hall of Comedies was the dark room, or Pieza Oscura, used as an occasional bedroom by Charles II. Philip V would use this space as an antechamber to his official bedroom, the next room to the east. In 1709, this room is named Comedy's Dressing Room, indicating that it had only temporarily served as the king's bedroom. This relaxation in the rigid palace etiquette is apparent during troubled times of war and economic crisis. After the war, the monarchs would have separate apartments once again, although only for the sake of appearances. The Queen's apartment had traditionally been situated towards the east side of the Alcazar, around the medieval Torre del Bastimento, which thick walls are still apparent in the 1705 map. Ardemans attempted a regularization of this area, closing the south galleries in the east or Queen's court, thus creating small, intimate spaces for the Queen and her retinue. 
the room of the Furies, Pieza de las Furias, was the central space in this section of the building, receiving new interior decoration in order to make it more comfortable for the young queen. For the room of the Furies, as early as 1702, new floor tiles from Talavera were commissioned. They were not the traditional red and yellow tiles that we see in Habsburg portraits, such as the one in the picture, but tiles with more elaborate designs of flowers and geometrical effects, combining blue, black and white with yellow accents, possibly an inexpensive compromise that, far from the French tradition of wooden floors, supported local manufacturers. These rooms were furnished with pieces from the royal household, sometimes newly upholstered in crimson velvet and gold embroidery that would have created a rich and warm environment for the winter, opting for a red taffeta for the summer. Carved and gilt tables and console tables with elaborate Pietro Dura tops were brought from the palace of Buen Retiro, to which lacquer writing tables and large mirrors were added. One of the most significant changes in the use of furniture upon the arrival of the Bourbon dynasty was the use of formal seating furniture. According to Spanish tradition, in official events, only the king could sit down in an armchair, while the grandees could sit on stools, and the rest of the court had to stand up. Philip V maintained this tradition at the beginning of his reign, but the relaxed atmosphere of the royal family's private life required more sitting furniture. For the first time, Spanish craftsmen create sitting furniture following the French taste, with comfortable padding on the back, seat, and occasionally the armrests. Another Spanish particularity was the dais or raised platform where respectable women would sit on cushions to read, knit, and play instruments. A medieval reminiscent of palace etiquette that Queen Maria Luisa of Savoy was determined to change. A change that was closely followed by the noble women eager to imitate the new fashions. The Hall of Mirrors, to the left of the picture, had an important ceremonial role under Habsburg rule because it united the king's and the queen's apartments. Its vaults were painted with frescoes depicting mythological scenes by Juan Carreño de Miranda, Ricci and the Italians Colonna and Nitelli. This room was, together with the Pieza Ochavada, here to the right, the only space with a unified decoration in the Alcazar. It had mirrors decorated with Habsburg eagles and porphyry console tables supported by gilt bronze lions. It is thus surprising to learn the king's wishes to remove the console tables, even at a risk of damaging the tabletops. This first campaign for redecorating the interior of the Algazar is a short one, due to the occupation of Madrid by the army led by the Archduke Charles of Austria in 1710. Because of this, works will not recommence until 1715. Towards the building's facade, Ardemans created a new enfilade of rooms destined to be used as spaces for royal representation, ending in the east wall of the Hall of Mirrors, where the new throne was placed. This was a clear reference to Versailles' own Galerie de Glace. Let's now focus on the second decorative campaign. We can study this campaign thanks to the map and elevations by French amateur architect and draftsman Antoine Duverger, designed in 1711. The works carried out during this period continued the intention of regularizing the spaces as well as differentiating the private use of the building towards the inner courts from the public use towards the facade. In this sense, it is significant to notice the change of name in the Hall of Comedies to Gran Salón para sus Majestades en particular, something that we could translate as Grand Gallery for their Majesties in particular. Archival documents suggest that these changes were orchestrated by the Princesse de Sursin, who kept a dynamic correspondence with Ardemans. Thanks to Duverger's elevations, we can see how the interior walls were organized, 
with an imposing regular cornice running all along the newly distributed rooms that supported dome platforms. Bear in mind that we are looking at these elevations facing south, with the inner court to our back and the square opposite us. In the inner set of rooms, the cornice served to frame the high windows that brought light to these potentially dark spaces. We see here at the top the enfilade of private rooms created by Ottomans. What was left of the long hall of comedies is in the middle, serving as a link between the king's official bedroom and the queen's bedroom. Completing the lighting system for such potentially dark rooms were a series of chandeliers after designs by Ottomans, here in the picture. In 1712, Robert de Côte, Louis XIV's architect, received the commission of designing a new palace in the French taste for the Buen Retiro, as well as new designs for the interiors of the Alcazar. De Côte sent his assistant René Carlier to Madrid, with the intention of taking the necessary measurements. Carlier remained in the Spanish capital as an unofficial architect to the king, relegating the role of Ardemans to that of surveyor of repairs. The idea was to redecorate the inner rooms with wall panellings and parquet floors, more appropriate for the private apartments of the royal couple. As we have seen before, the role of the Princesse de Saussin was crucial in this commission. This map, dated 1713, is known as the parquet floor map, conceived as a guide to create and install parquet floors, thus replacing the terracotta floors much disliked by the Queen. Possibly the most interesting documents conserved are the sections by Robert de Côte. We will follow the east-west enfilade in our analysis. Only one design of the north wall is known for the king's bedroom. It shows a central mirror framed by pilasters that seem to support the brackets on either side of the top central window. The court knows how to marry the existing architectural elements of a marked Spanish character with his French additions. The mirror rests on a dado or lambris d'appui that runs along the room unifying the space. The decorative elements in this scheme are far away from the monumentality of Louis XIV's Grand Coup characteristic of the previous decades. They are more in line with 18th century subtleties, announcing what we know as Regent style that flourished in Paris during the regency of the Duc d'Orléans after the death of Louis XIV. This period would make extensive use of some decorative elements, such as the female mask crowning the mirror, the trellis work on either side of the mask, and the use of delicate arabesques that symmetrically combine palms, ribbons and foliage in the pilasters. Opposite the mirror, a state bed was placed. The lack of a chimney confirms that this was just a formal bedroom, probably never used by the king. Finally, the Spanish coat of arms accompanied by lion's head, not depicted here in this picture, would have finished the decoration of the room. Following the sequence, we get to what was left of the old Hall of Comedies, now dedicated to the Greek god Hermeneus, protector of marriage. This room served as a link between the king's and the queen's bedrooms. It was the only room dedicated to classical mythology, something probably not surprising in a country that favoured religious subjects, a tenuous reference to the succession of rooms dedicated to classical gods at Versailles. The room was decorated with six mirrors, four of them on either side of the east and west doors, flanked by pilasters with similar design to the ones projected for the king's bedroom. On the north wall, a chimney piece surmounted by a mirror acted as a focal point. The court's designs propose several solutions for this wall that include the possibility of choosing between an arched mirror similar to the ones on the side walls here to the left, or a mirror surmounted by a medallion here to the right, as well as either a square or an arched chimney piece. He even suggests a symmetrical design for the south wall, opposite the chimney here to the right, where the mirror would meet the dado on a crossbow motif 
characteristic of the Agence style. A third design for a chimney piece was later supplied by René Carlet, this time with beautiful gilt bronze mounds depicting Flora and Zephyrus. From the room of Jimenez, passing the Pieza del Cancel, we get into the Queen's bedroom. The court's drawing shows a mirror similar to that projected for the previous room, with the main difference that this room had only four up windows, making it impossible for the court to match the pilasters on either side of the mirror with the ceiling brackets, and therefore deciding to abandon these pilasters altogether. A handwritten note mentions that this ensemble followed the design of a room made for Madame Dantin. For this room, Carlier also proposed an alternative design for the chimney piece. Made in marble, it included gilt bronze mounds that bring fashionable Rococo decoration into the palace. It was later transferred to Philip V's favourite palace of La Granja de San Ildefonso in Segovia's mountains. The fourth and last room in this sequence is the Room of the Furies, for which only the marble chimney piece, also now at La Granja, and its design by Carlier here in the picture, have survived. Here we see its incipient rococo shape and a decoration characteristic of the Regence period. Sadly, this lavish project never came to fruition. Due to a delay in the payments, the wooden panelling and parquet floors remained in Paris, and only the chimney pieces and other marble elements were sent to Madrid. The reason for this change of mind could be explained by the fall into disgrace of the Princesse de Sursin after the death of Queen Maria Luisa in February 1714. With the arrival of Isabella Farnese at the court of Madrid, the works to refurbish the interiors of the Alcazar continued under the direction of René Carlier who gained the position of royal architect until his death in 1722. He was charged with reusing oriental lacquer and mother of pearl panels from the royal collection for the wall decoration of the Room of the Furies. These would have been one of the first lacquer cabinets in Spain, following the European fashion for what is known as chinoiserie decoration. To these panels, Gavalier proposed adding monochromatic paintings as well as wall consoles for the display of bronze statues and mounted gemstones known as alhajas, a set of lavishly decorated table pieces that Philip V inherited from his father, the Grand Dauphin. It seems that this arrangement was in place by 1721, except for the inclusion of the alhajas, which remained in their leather boxes. Their place could possibly have been occupied by pieces of oriental porcelain from the Queen's collection. The last chapter in our story is marked by the arrival of the French painter Jean Rinck in 1729. Among the royal portraits that he completed for the family of Philip V, this one from the Prado Museum shows us the type of elegant and unified interiors that were favoured by the royal family. Rinck didn't only paint portraits, he also designed a set of rooms situated in the main floor on the southwest corner of the Alcazar, known as West Gallery or Galleria de Poniente. Executed from March to September 1734, this was the last decorative campaign in the Alcazar before the fire that destroyed it in December that year. Despite not being a trained architect, Hank supervised the works, proposing designs to the monarchs and liaising with the craftsmen. Some of the original 17th century fresco paintings in these rooms were restored, but when restoration was not possible, painted canvases were encased on the ceilings. This was a relatively quick and inexpensive solution, and it was also applied on the walls, creating the effect of carved datas along the rooms that replaced the traditional tiles. With this solution, rooms acquired a comfortable and warm atmosphere. Hank also included carved wooden chimney pieces, mirrors and gilt bronze candelabra on gilt wood wall consoles brought from Paris. The ensemble was completed with damask curtains that would have given the set of rooms an intimate and refined atmosphere. Sadly, no images from this set of rooms have survived. Nonetheless, their sense of unified decoration in a refined French taste 
can be exemplified in this portrait by Rank around 1723. Here, Philip V and his family sit in a comfortable yet opulent interior, probably one of the galleries at the Buen Retiro Palace, where painted ceilings, architectural elements, encased paintings, sculptures, lighting and furniture shared an aesthetic of dignity and refinement that marked the reign of Philip V. I would like to thank the Spanish Embassy in London for this opportunity, José Luis Sancho from Patrimonio Nacional for his advice, and all of you for listening. Thank you.